We are here in Edmonton on November the 20th, uh, 2015, for the opening of a show of new works by Andrew Balco at the Douglas Shedell Gallery. And we're going to take this opportunity to have a conversation with uh, Andrew about his work and about uh, how he's come to where he is today. So, Andrew, welcome. Thank you. Uh, first question I've got to ask you, uh, where were you born and raised, and how did you get to Canada? Um, I was born in Prague. Uh, which was then Czechoslovakia, and uh, um, I don't know if you know the history, but uh, basically after World War II, the Russians took uh, control of uh, Czechoslovakia as a communist bloc, and 1968 uh, uh, in Czech Republic, there was actually the original uh, Solidarity Movement, and so uh, the Czechs wanted to separate from Russia, and Russia sent in an army to suppress the Oh. Uh, the uprising, and at that time, my parents had enough of it, and we escaped to Austria. From Austria, we came to Canada. And when was this roughly? In 1968. So okay. I was about 12 years old. Oh, okay. So you spent your formative years. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I spent uh, shooting slingshots at Russian tanks. Everybody is always curious what makes an artist an artist? What drives an artist to want to be an artist? So, in your case, what is that? What was the impetus? or? Um, I, th I think initially uh, it's something you're born with. I don't think it's something that you can acquire along the way. So you're born with uh, uh, artistic ability. What you do with it is another story. I mean, right. that's the people will continue doing it. But uh, in my case, it was definitely uh, I, I decided uh, that I wanted to be an artist, not understanding what that was, at exactly the age of five. And how do you, how do you know that? Uh, because my mother told me uh, that we were walking down the street and she said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a world famous artist. Really? And she said, what is a world famous artist? And I said, it's a guy who sits in a little room with a little wooden stove that he cooks his food on and he paints. And that was my idea of uh, what that was like. And, and Basically, I did not deviate from that plan. I always wanted to be an artist, and so all through my, you know, childhood, I knew what I wanted to do. So there was no question. So do you still have the stove? No, and I actually say always that I'm not a world famous artist. <laughs> central heating. <laughs> there you go. Too I, much luxury. I, yeah, yeah, I deviated from that original yeah. plan. But I mean, that was, you know, that was. I always wanted to do it. My entire life, through the entire school, uh, I did all the artwork, I was in all the competitions. They always said, oh, you know, my parents' teachers, conference, they said, oh, your son, they showed their pic my pictures. Um, and on one hand, it was a really good thing, because I, I had no um, uh, question about what's going to happen with my life. On the other hand, because I was so focused on that, I avoided a lot of things in life. Uh, and I, you know, because I just disregarded it because this is what I'm going to do. And uh, later on, I sort of had to catch up with something. Thin things like what would you say? Um, you know, like I would go through school not really uh, paying attention to certain things right. because I didn't think that would be important. Right. Right. But, you know, different things. Anything to aid your pursuit of wanting to be a world famous artist is what you were attracted. To. Exactly. It was, uh, you know, all through high school, I did all the musical, I did all the yearbooks, I did everything, so it was continuous focus on that. Lots of artists credit other artists as influence, or um, do you have anything like that in your... You know, because of the work that I do, because I do obviously representational work, a lot of people assume that a lot of my influences were representational artists who did realistic or representational work. Uh, I would have to say that over the years, uh, I've looked at a lot of different artists, and uh, I've looked at a lot of uh, uh, abstract work. I looked at specific things in paintings that will help my painting. Mm -hmm. So it could be, let's say, a color relationship rather than you know, the execution of the entire painting. So I'll, I'll look at Motherwell, let's say, and I look at his color use. Right. And I'm, so I'm, I'm being influenced by that to use in my paintings. I'm not, and over the years, there's just been so many different people. Is it, is it a practice that you make that you, when you're looking at other art, you're consciously aware of, of trying to see things that will help yours? Or, or is it something that just happens automatically when you're looking at art? 
Yeah, I think when I was young, uh, I looked at everything. Like I would go to, uh, you know, uh, Sunday painter shows, because everybody had something to offer, mm -hmm. and there was always something. As you get older and you sort of hone in on your language, your personal language, you start eliminating what really interests you, what doesn't, so it becomes a little bit more specific. But also as you go along, it changes, so you're always looking for, uh, you have different problems that need to be solved, so you're looking for those solutions in different work. Right. And so, you know, it's, it's constantly evolving. My wife, which was then my girlfriend, uh, was going to go to Asia, to Hong Kong, and I, and I went with her. And then I decided, well, since I'm going to go all the way there, this was, you know, I was quite young, I was in my 20s, I decided uh, I might as well uh, do something there. You know, it's also part of my personality. So um, I sort of looked into it, and I don't know if you remember Nabur Savai. Sure. Nabur Savai, um, I met him, and he worked in a studio. He was associated with a studio in Tokyo, Toshi Yoshida Studio. And he told me about his place, and I decided I'm going to go there. And I just had the name, and I landed in Tokyo, and I looked him up, and I went to see him. And he said, yeah, you can work here. And uh, so I sort of stumbled into it. And I spent uh, several months there, and then I went back several times for a few months at a time. But it's a long story why the MDF. Anyways, I, I, I was working on uh, woodblock prints, which involved wood and carving. Uh, I returned to Canada, and uh, I thought um, I should apply carving to paintings. And I did, and I was doing, at one point, fairly heavily carved paintings, which led me, obviously, I started with plywood first, but then I realized plywood's not a really a long-term support because in this weather it can crack. Yeah. So I moved to MDF, and uh, I was doing fairly heavily carved painting, and I was doing paintings that were um, cutouts, and uh, it started getting really sculptural. And I decided, well, um, do I really want to move into the sculptural uh, area? And I realized I was more interested in ideas, so I sort of went came back to doing, uh, you know, working on, on stories, which is what I do in, in paintings. Mm -hmm. And I remained working on the MDF because I MDF because I still actually do some linear carving uh, into the panels before I paint on them. And so, um, obviously, you can't carve into canvas, right? So that's why I remained with the panel. And on one hand. The panel itself, the MDF, is, uh, I think every everything you use in art, on one hand, it's really good and, and, and it helps you. On the other hand, it's not an easy surface to work on. Right? Because of your abilities and, be, and your work has such a realistic tone to it, people always are interested in the technical aspects of, you know, how, how do you get this to work like this? How does it come right. off looking as it does? And I know you've chosen for example, you work on MDF. Yeah. That choice would be made because? Um, well, just the style of work. Um, you know, a lot of people think that I'm really interested in realism or that kind of work. And it, I am, but the reason I'm really doing that kind of work is just really part of my personality. It, I need to get it to that level. Right. It's not that I really want to get it to that level or that I think that that is. Uh, that is the way art should be. The only way, yeah. The only way. Yeah. It's just I need to do it. So it's it's a it's a it's a personality trait. And uh, interesting, over the years, I met different artists, and I saw their work, and I met the person, and you can see how the personality fits the painting. Right. You know, you meet somebody who could not spend three weeks or months working on a piece. Yeah. They need to get it done. It's just it's not part of them. So uh, the execution is really, I need to do it, not because I'm thinking that that is the best of art. Right. I've seen art that takes five minutes, and I think it's uh, just as successful as something that takes two months. So speaking of subject in your art, what's made you choose the kind of subject that you do work with? Uh, you know, over the years, uh, like when I was younger, I tried different things, and because I was looking for of a personal language, which I think uh, is important for an artist to establish their personal language and vision, and uh, that is one of the most difficult things, really. And I tried a lot of different things, and um, uh, 
eventually, I think the first series um, that sort of uh, resonated with me and I felt this was things I wanted to talk about was the Motel series. And uh, I... Is this the 2400? 2400, yeah. And basically, uh, I used to travel lots. A lot of the paintings were from places I used to travel to. Right. And when my son was born in uh, 1993, I couldn't travel as much, and I remember the, this motel in Vancouver, the 2400, which was a fairly famous motel. And um, uh, I had a dealer in Vancouver, and we were going to do a show, and I was sort of, you know, what was going to do. So I flew out to Vancouver, and I lived at the motel for two weeks. And that whole series was born from that, and it also actually established uh, a lot of the things that I wanted to talk about, you know, relationships between people. And, like that, so that's how it, uh, that's how it started. That's how the the ideas for different paintings, and then it sort of evolved uh, from that series. Um, you know, then it sort of links from one to the next as you're working on something. Like in the motels, there was a lot of uh, TV screens. The TV screens linked me to uh, driving theaters, uh, driving theaters. Um, uh, linked me to computers and. And so on. So then you sort of establish an interest in certain things, and you just pursue it. Uh, and sometimes you leave it. Like I work in these different series. Sometimes I, I leave it for a period of time, and I work heavily in this series. And then I return it because it's fresh or there's a new idea. So um, you mentioned this morning we were having a bit of a conversation about how when a show is about to open, you find it's almost anticlimactic in your emotions because you've been pushing and pushing studio, you've been pushing against the timetable, uh, against your own art, your own uh, set of uh, equations that you aim for. Uh, so what, when you said that it's kind of anticlimactic, what, what did you mean by that? Um, it, it's not just the artist, but uh, there's a known fact that if people are focused on a certain task for a long period of time, and you give it all, and then it's over with that you experience this emptiness. And uh, I remember young, being younger and experiencing not really understanding. And uh, interestingly, I found an article on an art, this is many years ago, I cut it off. I don't, I don't remember who did it, I still have it at home. And the article exactly explains how, uh, it, of course it explains it, uh, and it's, it's, um, it's focused on artists. That, you know, when you're working on a project, you're, you're so involved and you eliminate a lot of other things life and you're so focused that when it's over you do experience this sense of emptiness and loss and uh, you're sort of out of sorts and it's a period of time that I think a lot of artists experience and I mean you have to recognize it that's it was interesting in the article is that you have to recognize it to deal with it because if you don't you know you're, you're experiencing you could experience anxiety or all kinds. all kinds of things, and you have to understand where it's coming from to deal with it. And you have, to, and you know, some people take a very short time to get over it, some people a long time. Right. Um, so that that's sort of what I was talking about. Okay. Because you you also hear these stories, um, and the general public who are involved, I'm sure would be curious to know about. Uh, you hear the story about well, artists never want to let their work go, like they're not. You know, I've had occasions where the children of, part of painters were quite shocked to see that their that parents' paintings were up on the wall being sold and taken by somebody else, right. and were not uh, happy with that at all. They didn't want to see these things. I don't know if there's any of that in your... I have absolutely no problem with that. And the reason is because, you know, obviously my things are a little time-consuming right. and quite involved. And when it's finished, uh, you know, I don't necessarily finish them, they finish me. Okay. And I'm and I actually like to uh, have it gone. Have it gone. There's some that I really, really love, uh, but still. Yeah. And it's strange because then you see it years later, like you're sort of done with it, right? You know what I mean? And then years later you go to somebody's house or somewhere and you see the painting and then you look at it and say, Hey, you know, that was not bad. Uh -huh. And then you start panicking with the what you're doing now is as good as then. Interesting. Yeah, so I, I have no issue with it, and um, um, you know, it's part of, part of 
what I do, and I like it to get out there. So it's kind of like an ambassador. <laughs> and and again, speaking of that, like how do you see your work uh, and and current culture? Like how do you see your work fitting into the current culture of what is happening in the world? Uh, well, you know, looking at the art world today uh, in Canada, I mean, not necessarily in other countries, but in Canada. Um, uh, art is sort of like fashion, you know, uh, you're always looking at the new and exciting and the contemporary. Um, sometimes I find that because of the way I execute my paintings, that uh, um, people think it doesn't really fit into a contemporary mode, although the contemporary, uh, I deal with contemporary issues. Right. And but because, because you paint realistically? I think it's because I paint realistically. And because you know, a lot of the art today uh, is not uh, skill driven, right. and uh, and and I and I'm not saying it's bad in any way, uh, but you know I'm not just con concentrating on the content of the painting. I'm concentrating also on the actual execution of it. Right. So in other words, I'm trying to, and I'm constantly, uh, you know, working on it. I'm working on the surface, the color, the composition. Um, you can move something inch over in the composition of the painting and you can involve the viewer in a completely different way than when it's inch this way. So you, it's, it's a very carefully crafted image and that uh, really relates to the, to the viewer. And I also feel that um, uh, every decision um, that is made, you know, you get the brush, you get the paints. Every every dab of paint, everything that you put on, it's your personal decision that I feel resonates with the viewer, and it can influence the viewer. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to see what uh, the same story uh, no. or the same ideas that I'm trying to break across. Right. But you are translating all all those things to the viewer, and uh, you can use the color, the texture, the composition. Everything to make that painting um, is evoke what, kind of evoke memory yeah. in the viewer. Or yeah. Evoke, yeah, yeah. It's uh, and a lot of people don't understand what the stuff that you're doing. You know, in, in other words, uh, another artist might right. they might say, "Oh, look at the beautiful way you you did these brush strokes and stuff." So the the viewer might not understand the technical aspect of it. Right. Uh, it's sort of like you know when you watch tennis, you might not understand. Technical aspect of the game, you can appreciate it, but will affect you. And that's the same with the painting. It will affect the viewer, you might not even understand what it is that they're right. really being affected how, by. Yeah, how it's yeah. going. But. Well, I want to thank you for your time. Okay. And uh, yeah. Thank you, Doug. My pleasure.